watch her. I was born in a cross by a hurricane. But I howled in the morning driving rain. But it's all right now. In fact, it's a guess. But it's all right. I'm jumping jetfish. It's a guess, guess, guess. Welcome to the breakfast show. is a tune that's taken for granted as it was heard so many times. A tune not having that check mark next to it and a high grade on a live album. And one is at times bypassed. What do you want for the most played live Stone song? Bill Wyman would say, It is one of their best tracks ever that reads Jagger Richards. I feel it's time to brush off these cobwebs off this song and put this song back on top to enjoy as a deep listen. A listen and appreciation like it's the first time hearing it again. It is a song saved for the end of a show as time went on for a reason. The energy and love for the song, the passion and devotion they still give when they play this. The Stones love this song. It's a true adrenaline rush. I'll be playing you some live samples through the years. And if this documentary does not snap you out of it, then I hope you were there already. Rule number one. Don't let this song slip through the cracks and sneak through. Take it and run with them. Satanic Majesty's Request was released December 67 by Decca and London. Produced by the Stones. The first album not having Andrew Luke Oldham in charge. He was like a father figure. Despite being his age and younger, he was keeping them all in line. Andrew would say the reason he would depart was that he thought the Stones were not concentrating and also being childish. Now also, Andrew was himself a heavy partier and heavy drinking and drugs. He did lose some control. Well, at that time, the Stones were in their drug frenzy during that satanic time. And that was the outcome without Andrew. 
Many would call it a masterpiece, and many could take it or leave it, and would believe it did not represent the stones. Now, having left their strength and did this album, they would want to return and get their focus back. Now, Decca pressured them, and they wanted to release a new set of Stones material. They wanted a new single. It was long overdue. Now, the Beatles and EMI in 67, they released Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. They did that first from the not-yet-released Sgt. Peppers. We now enter into the story of the single of Jumpin' Jack Flash. It was intended for a new album, but the enthusiasm was so great, the single was pushed out. As I did my research on this song, and I was looking at every angle I could, the one thing that stood out was the interpretations of the song. There are so many ways that people looked at this and looked into the deep lyrics and what it meant to them. Some of them went like this. Flash is the blood, and gas is the heroin injection. Spike through is when heroin goes into the brain, and then the thrill is a gas, gas, gas. A story of anyone overcome burden and hardships in life. Jack is saying it's all right now but it was not in the past. When you take morphine, you vomit, known as flashing, bad stuff happened, but it's all right now. A destructive path for innocent people while there is a war. A man about to jump into action like a soldier, gas, 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 it represents how the conflict is fueled about someone's hard life and after death is enjoying his stay in hell. Jumpin' Jack Flash is the devil. A dance done in hell, jumping around to keep feet from being burned by the hot coals. Jumpin' Jack Flash was a practice of administering liquid LSD with an eyedropper in the tear ducts. John F. Kennedy, JFK, with Rose K. Mom, she was strict with a strap. Third verse deals with JFK in war and his training and service as a PT boat captain. Being crowned with a spike through my head was the assignment. Gas was the limo speeding away. It's about Jesus cruelly being treated. Those that did the beatings, it's all right now, and forgiven as Jesus knew it was Satan. Heaven is going to be a blast. And a song inspired by the Beatles' Day Tripper. So there you go. Just listing a few. Summon Jimmy Miller. But before we dive into Jimmy, we need to know more about who, what, where, and why and jump down this rabbit hole. So that brings us to Chris Blackwell, the founder of Island Records in 1958. He made his way into pop music in 64 with a Jamaican singer, 15 years old, the cover of My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. Yeah, you know this one. This song was licensed to Fontana Records. That's the Dutch label off of Philips. Now, Chris would venture for more talent in London. And in 1965, he would find a new group of young talent at a London club with a Birmingham band called the Spencer Davis Group. They had a front man called Stevie Winwood, a teenager. 
Stevie's older brother, Muff, played the bass. Chris would recognize immediately his talent and see that he had a young Ray Charles here, and he would sign the group immediately, 1965, on the Fontana label also. The Spencer Davis group was competition with the Stones. They played similar music. Both bands would play the similar cover songs also. What's worth noting is Spencer Davis, he played guitar, and he would form a band called The Saints with a bass player called Bill Wyman. In 63, he would form his group, initially called the Rhythm and Blues Quartet, with Stevie, Muff, and the great Peter York on drums. They would change their name because Spencer was the only one comfortable talking to the media. Stevie was 15 years old when they formed. In 1965, Chris Blackwell was in the U.S. He was scouting and looking for material that he can release in the U.K. And he came upon a song called Incense. And who produced it and created it? Jimmy Miller. Chris would release this on Fontana in the UK as he was really impressed with the work of Jimmy. The song became a success in the UK and with the Spencer Davis group having issues getting established in the US, it was Chris that reached out to Jimmy again to come and work with the band. Chris wanted Jimmy to work on the album Give Me Some Lovin'. It was already released in the UK, but he wanted him to remix it for the US. Chris had the insight and he felt it really needs something more, something different to be able to excel and climb the charts in the US. So here is the original UK 1966 version, Give Me Some Lovin'. And the vocals are clearly different and pay attention to the bass and the drumming. Now the U.S. version, you can hear the magical work of Jimmy and what he brings. A driving bass and a slapping of the drums. Eventually, Jimmy Miller and Stevie Winwood would embark on a wonderful friendship. Jimmy would even get some songwriting credits as a co-writer on the song I'm a Man. With Stevie Winwood, we have a lot of hindsight now and see what was happening in his life. There was so much history and connections and changes happening at that point. He wanted to move out and expand his talents and he wanted to leave the group. So he did in April 67. He and three others formed a little band called Traffic. A worthy note, Dave Mason was a roadie for the Spencer Davis group. And there was a London band called Traffic Jam already, but they ended up changing their name to Status Quo. So after the recording of I'm a Man, Stevie left and he asked Jimmy, to come on board to produce the first album, Mr. Fantasy. Island Records and Chris Blackwell wanted to break big, and they had traffic under their wings and supported them. Chris was all in. Well, Mr. Fantasy was recorded in Olympic Studios, and that's where Jimmy was now having his new home. And Olympic Studios was a mecca in the mid-60s for recording artists, similar to Abbey Road. It had state-of-the-art and moving forward, but most important, it had some super group, talented 
engineers that were exposed and working there. One of them was George Chikayans. I mentioned him working with the Stones and Brian Jones and so many others. You really need to look him up. Check out what work he has done. He gets credit for developing the use of phasing in recordings. And that was big, as we know, it's you know, psychedelic music. And we know Mr. Fantasy also. Jimmy would help on Mr. Fantasy doing some percussion also, in addition to the producing. Now, I'm going to share a story from the engineer, Eddie Kramer. And he was observing Jimmy in the studio and watching him in action firsthand and seeing his greatness and why he was. For the song Dear Mr. Fantasy, the band was set up on a riser at one end of the studio, opposite the control room. They were set up like they were just on stage. Eddie recorded them live to a four track. Now, they were in the middle of a take, and it's right at the point in the song for Mr. Fantasy where the tempo is changing. Eddie looked in the control room and he didn't see Jimmy there. Next thing he sees is Jimmy hauling an ass across the room. He jumped up on the riser, picked up maracas, and got them to double the tempo. That's Jimmy. Jimmy had an amazing ability to take a group of musicians, rehearse with them, and get them in the studio, and have them be so excited about what they were going to do and create. And he made it seem fun. His energy was always up, always into the band and gets the band to see and feel the song the way he did. It's important to know about Jimmy and his qualities. His legacy as a Stones contributor and catalyst is essential to know about. There was a Jimmy Miller buzz going on in the industry and he was getting a fast track reputation to greatness. Someone that knew how to find the groove. Mick had told Glenn Johns he wanted to get a new American producer, and Glenn was not so pleased with that. But he told Mick there happens to be a good one here already, and he's fantastic, and I know him. Glenn had told Mick about Jimmy, and he is the one that they should work with. Mick had dropped by a session to see and observe Jimmy up close. I believe from what I was reading, uh, Jimmy was working with Dave Mason on music in a doll's house by the band Family. And then it came. It was uh, the winter of 67, 68. And I came home one night and my wife said, uh, honey, uh, Mick Jagger called. I want you to call him back. Left his number. And... I just got a flash as she said that he, he wants me to produce them. And uh, then I very nervously called up and Mick said, Jimmy, uh, can you come by? I'd like to, uh, to talk to you about something. And I agreed and stopped by his house. We had some tea and sat and talked for a few minutes. And uh, he said uh, he had liked the things I did with Traffic and Spencer Davis Group and had been aware of my productions for some time. and. Uh, uh, told me that they were splitting up or had split up with the, with Andrew and with the people they had been with business-wise up to that time. And they were looking for a producer and would I be interested? Just as, as simply as that. And uh, they had material at that time for an album which was to become Beggar's Banquet, which was the first series of sessions that we worked on. And I think the first track we cut was a uh, street fighting man but the first one we finished was jumping jack flash which was issued as a single prior to the album so that was my first release as a producer with the stones stones would play jimmy some of their ideas of new tracks now jimmy he did not insist at all to get them to leave the psych genre he would say that they were already prepared to do so so the end of an era and the beginning of another one. A new chapter was being created without anyone realizing what was happening. A bridge was opened up and they wanted to cross over. 
one of their most pivotal songs in their catalog. Yeah, there are a few of them. But this one should hold a special place in our hearts as it represents the true flavor and direction of where the stones would go from here. A more aggressive sound, they would hit overdrive, and they would end up leaving a lot of the British bands behind, except some exceptions, particularly The Who. Their patented and signature sound would drive that nail hard into the rock of the roll. This song is so pure and represented the Stones' new direction and where and how they would now be true as a guitar band. As I mentioned earlier, this is the most live performed song in their entire catalog. And it's for a good reason. I'm going to do my version of what happened during their song's birth from the start to finish. Some of the topics I'm sure you're going to be familiar with, it's going to be obvious to you. But I gotta still mention it. However, you will hear some new info, I am sure. I do have to say, after research, the exact timeline I found was a little bit unclear. So I'll present it the best I can chronologically. Let's jump into the end of 1967, October. Brian had attended court for cannabis and hash. He admitted to that, but not the cocaine possession. He pled guilty and received a 12-month sentence, and he was out on bail the next day pending an appeal. It was a mistake by him to plead guilty. He was claimed to be ill, bipolar, but that was not identified back then for sure. On December 12th, with Mick attending, Brian had the court appeal and medical evidence that was used and mentions Brian becoming suicidal. Now, who knows exactly when Brian was starting to fall apart, but this was a good point. Give some thanks to Mandrax. Judges decided not to deliver the prison sentence, but instead deliver a three-year probation and a fine of a thousand pounds in order to seek psychiatric help. On December 13th, Brian was taken to the hospital after found unconscious in his apartment. This was due to drug and alcohol use. He would return to the health treatment center. So late in December 67, Mick and Marianne, they go to the Bahamas. Keith and Anita, they go to Morocco. Brian goes to Sri Lanka. Bill and Astrid go to Sweden. And Charlie's home. In January of 68, Mick would purchase an apartment in Chester Square, London. Keith is finishing up recovery in Paris. He'd caught hepatitis in Morocco. Now we knew Brian became friends with Jimi Hendrix from the Monterey Pop Festival in summer of 67. Now in the January time frame, Brian had joined Jimmy at the Olympic Studios, January 21st, 1968. Eddie Kramer was the engineer. At this session, Jimmy would record that historic piece all along the watchtower. I'm gonna go down this little hole here with Jimmy and recording of All Along the Watchtower. And it was a song that was recently released. Not many people had heard it. And Jimmy just grabbed it and ran with it. Shout out to chords. Now, he would have, of course, Mitch Mitchell on the drums and Noel Redding just briefly on the bass. He got sort of annoyed and pissed off and left because he didn't really want to play that song at least not their version. And he basically told Hendrix to fuck off. So Dave Mason actually took some bass duties. Eventually, Jimmy would lay down the bass later. And Jimmy would also play some acoustic guitar along with Dave Mason. 
The reason why I'm also mentioning this story is because Brian was in the studio and wanting to contribute. So take number 14 had a drunk Brian Jones fiddling around on the piano and took about 23 seconds before Jimmy just told him, cut it out, cut it off, don't need it. So Brian was a good friend. Jimmy usually doesn't do this, but he was very serious for that moment. He just couldn't take just the banging and banging the way Brian was presenting it. It was pretty horrible. So Brian would eventually go to some percussion. You could hear him towards the end of each bar in the intro. He played an instrument called a vibra slap. songs and the session would actually take about 27 takes. Dave Mason was at the sessions. He played a 12-string guitar in this song, slightly out of tune. Let's hear Eddie Kramer's story about this with the sound. Wow, when you hear that track, a couple of things come to mind. You hear that slightly out of tune 12 string, that's Dave Mason, but underneath it, there's Jimmy playing all the heavy rhythmic upstrokes and downstrokes on the sixth string. It's an odd sounding 12 string. Let's listen to it again. It's really cool to hear the, how the two of them are playing together when they finally locked in, you know. Dave Mason's doing that prang, prang, and Jimmy's doing it's, to me, it's, it's a wonderful moment in the song to hear those two guys just locking in. Oh, one last note with Jimmy. February 1st, opening night at Fillmore West. He was with Albert King and John Mayle. Oh, and who was in John Mayle's band? Well, Mick Taylor. So the Stones were being preoccupied at this time frame, December and January. And Bill, he was doing some production with the group called End. They released an album later in season. And Charlie, well... His wife, Shirley, was ready for birth of their first child. So, Charlie was home. And Mick and Keith were back and forth at Redlands and Chelsea. So the timeline, early February to mid-February, Stones would start rehearsals for a new album. And this was also done at Keith's home at Redlands. February 21st till mid-March 68, they would have more rehearsals, but this time at R.G. Jones Studios in Morden, Surrey, near London. So Jimmy would encourage the Stones to get the essentials for the next album by getting away from outside influences. Jimmy had seen this ingredient of getting away from all when Steve Winwood and Traffic would all go out to the country cottage and they would focus. 
That is when Jimmy asked Keith if it was okay for them to go to the Redlands. So that was a time used for pre-rehearsals and laying out ideas and getting them on cassette. All right, we know this story, but I need to put it out there. Mick and Keith, they were up all night in Redlands working. Mick fell asleep on a sofa, Keith on an armchair. It was rainy and wet. It was around 6.30 in the morning. They were crashed. Keith's older gardener was outside by the window doing what he usually does, working and cleaning up. So Mick got startled by the clomping and sloshing of the gardener's boots. Waking up, asking, what is that sound? Keith, knowing who and what it was, he says, oh, that's Jack, Jumpin' Jack. Eventually, Mick would add, Flash. They were on to something. Now, going back to the uh, rehearsals, R.G. Jones rehearsals, Brian, Bill, and Charlie, they showed up early once, and they were doing the usual jamming while waiting for Mick and Keith. Bill was fooling around with a riff on a piano, a new one, and Brian and Charlie picked up on it, and they were playing it for a bit. Mick and Keith finally show up. They hear what they're playing, and Mick says to keep on playing it. Carry on. That's real good. And as Bill would say, that was the Jumpin' Jack Flash riff. We can remember Keith's satisfaction story and recording a riff on his cassette recorder and then falling asleep for the satisfaction riff, and that was back in 65. Keith would say Jumpin' Jack Flash and Street Fighting Man came about because he was fascinated with the new technology and opportunities and the possibilities of playing an acoustic through a cassette recorder and using the microphone as the pickup. Keith loved the cassette as an automated dictation. It was a dream for a lyricist. He used it constantly. The microphone can be inserted into the guitar opening and produce an overdrive, an overloaded sound, a distortion. This machine was his new notebook. So ideas, lyrics, they were put on cassette, they were brought to Jimmy. As I expose some of the interpretations of these genius lyrics, we're not sure where they were all written. Were they done in the Redlands? Were they done at the rehearsal or at the Olympic sessions? Just not sure. It's, I would think it's kind of unknown, but maybe all three. But I wanted to share this one story with you and a thought. You could shrug your shoulders, shake your head, no, or laugh. It's interesting. As folk tales carry on, especially in England. So let's go into this. There are so many thoughts of what this song is about and the opinions. And here is one topic that was thrown out there. There's a known tale that started around 1837 and predates well before Jack the Ripper. This thing or guy, whatever it was, was called spring Jack. This being described as having eyes like fire and hands like claws and able to jump from roof to roof. It was described as a grotesque figure that was witnessed by several and it also attacked women. Now by the 1850s and 60s, it was now seen all over England. Still seen in the 1870s and folks tried to set a trap, but no luck. spring Jack, last sighting was in the Victorian era of 1904 in Liverpool, leaping and jumping. He was supposedly cornered, but escaped and never seen again after that. It was supposedly given the name Jumpin' Jack Flash because of its behaviors. What do you do when you're on the road to amuse yourself? <laughs> well, part of the inevitable, you know, I think one of the best distractions is reading. 
I think it's better than TV because we really knew get away from the century even, you know, so that your, uh, you know, your imagination is okay like right there. Watching TV becomes a little bit tiresome in itself. So what sort of things do you read? What's your, what are you reading at the moment? Biographies, because you, you can look, pick them up and put them down. Biographies are really easy stuff. And easy novels, you know, nothing really heavy, you know. But a good heavy book to go to bed at night is good, you know. Some, some one of the classics or something, you'll go to bed straight away after sleep. So what's the current biography? Bernard Baruch. Who was he? He was a speculator in the early part of the... Well, he lived... He was a powerful from 1917 to 1960s. He was a financial and political guy. Kind of interesting. The crowd's getting rather restless and we're not even late. I think I'd better go. There are no secrets that Mick was a tangling with Lucifer in that topic matter. Now bring in Marianne. Mick was a literary and deep reader, being a fan of Ginsburg, Curac, Burroughs, and beat writers. But late 67, he steered towards the sinister side. He would be collecting some occult information and books on the topic. A fellow named Kenneth Anger was a close friend of the Stones and the Entourage. Now, he made the cult movie Lucifer Rising, now, Anger was a disciple of the black magician, Aleister Crowley. Anger was close to Marianne and Anita. Marianne would play in Lucifer Rising, the film about black magic and Egyptian gods summoning the angel Lucifer in order to push a new occult age. Marianne played the goddess Lilth. Let's just say it was a real trippy movie. Mick would also perform and play a score in Anger's 69 short movie, Invocation for My Demon Brother. Keith did also. I just bring this up and I tie this in because there are thoughts of some deep Jumpin' Jack Flash lyrics towards Satan and Lucifer. Well, a true devil song comes along soon enough anyway. There's also some mention that the lyrics for Jumpin' Jack Flash was inspired by a William Blake poem from 1908, The Mental Traveler. All just speculation and it's all open for your own interpretation. I just got to put it out there. So what I did was I broke down the lyrics, took out key words and removed adjectives and came up with this list. Born... Crossfire, Hurricane, Howled, Ma, Rain, Hag, Strap My Back, Drowned, Washed Up, Dead, Fell Down, Feet Bled, Crust, Bread, Crown, Spike, Head, and Gas. Well, bottom line to me, if it's a gas, it's fun. That's a gas. Keith had plenty background knowing about his local old school gardener and his stories. Jack would live a life in the countryside and not exposed to the city. As Jack was a topic for the title, they must have carried the theme on and they stayed with the story just about Jack. Who's to say Born in a Crossfire Hurricane was not about Jack the gardener? in World War I, if that line was related to anything to do with war. Drugs, war, leaving the psychedelic period, religion, Satan, all within what you, the listener, wants to interpret it to. It's the bottom line. But my favorite lyric line for this song is, Yeah, and I frowned at the crumbs of a crust of bread. How? Can you even interpret this line?
they knew how to combine lyrics in us. We just got to see the results. They would go from boys to men with this song. And copied out phrases from newspapers and magazines, then took a scissors and cut these selections into pieces and rearranged the fragments at random. Now there's also that one last theory, maybe Mick and Keith dabbled with that method of cut up. Cutting out lines of text, like from a newspaper, and piecing it together. It's just a thought. Not many of us know about R.G. Jones Studio. It's located south of London. This is where they went in to do some rehearsals. I found some info on this studio in itsonlyrockandroll.org, and it had this clip that I'm showing. This footage is from 1964. You see... It is taken at the studio. A band called Four Steps Beyond were filmed here with an 8mm as they wanted to make a record that they would sell at the clubs they played at. Uh, thanks, Brian Day555 YouTube channel for, for this. This is just to give you an idea of what the uh, studio looked like back then. And you could imagine the stones in this tight-knit quarters. Audio you hear is a jam from February 6th with all of them and Stu, possibly. So the Stones were playing their blues in these rehearsals. They were also doing some hard edge tunes and instrumental jams. And Jimmy and Eddie Kramer were here in the studio. And they opened with a song, My Home is a Prison, also known Shot My Baby. It's a Slim Harpo tune. Another song they would play is Hold On, I'm Coming. Sam and Dave tune from 1966. They would play this several times. And Mick would do some ad-libbing, but using satisfaction lyrics. baby another cut played several times mick would be playing some guitar on this one brian was absent from the some of these sessions though also he was actually in paris celebrating his birthday february 28th same as mine bill would not attend many of these sessions either but as i mentioned before the biggest moment that occurred was Bill playing that piano riff with Charlie and Brian and developing that Jumpin' Jack Flash melody.
As you see the tunes again on this list for R.G. Jones Studios, they did work with early versions of No Expectations and some Stray Cat Blues, which you're hearing now. Very different sound. Excuse me if I do repeat and become repetitive on some of this information. I want to just make sure it's put out there. What I'm going to present now is coming from the book Rolling Stones Gear, an essential book that is wonderfully written and presented and well worth it for any Stones fan. It's written by Andy Babick and Greg Prevost. And Jimmy Miller is basically talking about how they recorded this process with Jumpin' Jack Flash. And he would say starting off they would get together at Mick's enormous house on Chester Square. And they would be sitting in the empty rooms on a carpet and they would just run a cassette. And Keith would be playing a guitar and Mick and Keith would sing the song that they just written and let Jimmy hear it and showing them a bunch of the material. And would it start off with them pounding on the table and some percussion contributions and then record it on a cassette. And Jimmy had the idea to say, okay, let's take what we just have on cassette and record it onto the four track. Now also what was added was the toy kit drums that Charlie owned. So this same method was used at Olympic Studio, where they would sit in the circle, Keith, along with Charlie, playing those drums. What was also interesting was they didn't use batteries in the cassette recorder. They used the AC adapter cord, so it was a consistent flow and nothing that altered the sound. I'm not going to get into, but mention this, that for the single release, although... Jumpin' Jack Flash would be the ultimate release of a single. The first number the group recorded for the single was Pay Your Dues, which eventually went to Street Fighting Man. And as we see, the final say was Jumpin' Jack Flash took precedence over Pay Your Dues. We now go to the Jumpin' Jack Flash sessions at Olympic Studios, March 23rd to the 29th. 1968, Keith and Charlie were recorded on cassette. Then it was put on multi-track to get distortion. And when you overdrive that cassette, it has a natural distortion sound when it's played back. The cassette would act as a pickup and amp as the mic was jammed into the guitar hole. They would plug the cassette into a small extension speaker and then place a mic in front of that put that on tape so when jimmy heard this in the studio he connected immediately with keith's thinking and the end result that he wanted so what instruments were used in the studio well mick with the vocals keith with a 65 gibson hummingbird a 66 gibson es355 td playing lead and rhythm 1966 Fender Precision Bass. Keith also played Charlie's Ludwig Floor Tom, which we'll hear isolated. We hear also backing vocals from Keith. Charlie, he's playing a 1963 Oyster Pearl Ludwig, not the Gretsch yet. Now Brian is supposedly possibly using a Rickenbacker or the Gibson ES330 TD. Not 100% sure, but he most likely is buried somewhere in there or not even used. Bill will play the Hammond M102 organ, Ian Stewart Steinway piano, and Jimmy Miller, he's doing some backing vocals, 
Now, Jumpin' Jack Flash, when you hear it, it doesn't sound like a normal guitars. It has real uniqueness. That is due to open tuning. That is due possibly to the Nashville tuning and also recording through the cassette deck and giving distorted sounds. It is so unique, so different, and so cool. And the thing about it is the studio cut always will sound different than the live versions. So there's many theories, many thoughts, speculations, people analyzing and listening to this song and breaking it down. Many people hear different things, but in general, two, three guitars, we're not 100% sure, but it's full. <laughs> it has probably several. And open tuning. It could be open E, which doesn't use a capo. It could be open D, which does use a capo. It could be standard tuning. And then there's also something called Nashville tuning. That's a high-pitched, jangly sound that came from the 50s. They wanted to get a different sound, something high-pitch. And they took the high-pitched strings from a 12-string guitar. What I'm showing next is the guitar playing, the little tutorials that I found on YouTube that were kind of helpful, different perspectives, different tunings. One is open D with the Nashville guitar also playing, two guitars. The second one is a electric open E tuning. So for your non-guitarists, I hope you get something out of this and it's pretty good visually just to see what's going on. Keith plays this live, he plays it in open G. And that's using a capo on the fourth fret. Some more head scratching with the guitar licks, those leads. It's amazing. They sound like an electric guitar, and for a long time I thought it was, and especially that I never seen an acoustic playing it live. It comes across as is. It sounds like it. We see that you can play it, the leads, while strumming the chords. And Ronnie, I believe, plays those leads separately live with his guitar part. It's not known if this song is all acoustics. Doubt it. 
I believe there's an electric guitar in here. I'm going to show two videos on showing how Ronnie plays his guitar part, which is in standard tuning. The first video is pretty straightforward and showing the leads. And in the second video, the guy in the YouTube channel added a little bit more uh, double stops. I guess I'm making a point here that you talk to several people, you're going to get several different types of answers. Hey, if somebody out there knows something 100% sure, let me know. Now, the bass is played by Keith using a precision bass. It has Keith's pounding drive. He knew what he had in his head for this sound, and he transposed it Keith's way. It complements the guitars so well. As I'm playing YouTube channel HJ Reviews, Deconstructing Jumping Jack Flash, that isolates the tracks, which is really wonderful to hear. We hear besides the bass, of course, we hear Charlie. Right now I'm going to play you an early version of the song, and we hear a different approach here in the beginning with the tune and the delivery. A lot of yeah, yeahs and my, my's and woes. There is also later on a second watch it. the outro here we do hear a little bit more leads and also the Mellotron playing which I'll talk about more the ending has Mick singing the way he does it live and also the cold ending here is also the way they do it live What I'm going to take now is a version of Jumpin' Jack Flash from 2021, a stereo remix made by Tiger Rogers on YouTube. Tiger Rogers. Made a stereo version that's really cool, a lot of separation, gives you a good idea to hear everything clearly. So let's start this off. So the fun will begin with the two distorted guitars, the acoustics on each side. The bass comes rumbling in with the drums. 
And then right after Watch It, we hear the piano picking it up and playing with the guitars mixed right in that layer. You'll hear something that sounds like a dog barking. That is Keith playing the floor tom. It's repetitive throughout the song. What is fantastic is how Mick delivers the song and how he extends like every third word and the last word. I was born in a class by hurricane. And I howled at the morning. You didn't get that enormous combination sounding of everything with those leads for the chorus. What I'm going to play right now is a deconstruction, the isolation of the guitar part during the uh, chorus. So let's give a listen to that, and you'll be able to hopefully hear the Nashville tuning, that higher pitch. We come now into this interlude, this break here with this guitar riff going on, which is, to me, just fantastic and so well positioned. But also, what's really huge and not noticeable until you start focusing on it is the maracas. Now you hear them real clear here. the ending, the outro, where they all start singing Jumpin' Jack Flash, and how the explosion all of a sudden kicks in with that organ, and then also the Mellotron by Bill. Wonderful, wonderful. And it just extends out, and it goes and fades out. And that Mellotron at the very end, those last little notes are just amazing to me. I've listened to this song a hundred times now in this past month working on this project. I can't get enough of it still. It's mind-blowing, this tune. I read a couple pieces where some people thought it was Nicky on the Mellotron, but believing it is Bill, Bill did own a Mellotron. He got one in 1966. We do know Brian did play one also and contributed to early Stone songs with it. <laughs> it's the end. It's always the end key. I love it. So that's that, and then you got the sort of. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Let me take it 
So here's another version of Jumpin' Jack Flash. This one had a longer outro, and you get to hear more of the Mellotron, which I think is a wonderful piece to hear. Here you go. Mick would say, what hits you right away is the sound texture. He did not like the session much. It was haphazard to him. The end result was good, but not quite what he wanted. The fidelity wasn't that great, not quite in your face. Now, Keith would comment and mention his side of the musical style quality. He would say, it is almost Arabic very old, archaic, classical. The chord setups you could only hear in Gregorian chants or something like that. It is a weird mixture of your actual rock and roll, and at the same time, this weird echo of very, very ancient music that you don't even know. Pretty profound and deep type of comment. I'm going to try to attempt to bring forward what possibly Keith is referring to in making this analogy. Now again, my investigation here, there's some people who are thinking there may be some harmonica played. Maybe it's Brian. I'm not hearing harmonica, but who knows? This is just a thought. Possibility, but who knows for certain? This is my take. If Brian did some magical work contribution to Jumpin' Jack Flash, I think the Stones would have acknowledged this. Think about it. They were blown away when they heard Brian contributing to No Expectations. They proudly acknowledged this. If he did have any positive contribution for Jumpin' Jack Flash, I'm sure he would have been mentioned. Just my side. Jumpin' Jack Flash would be finished up April 20th at Olympic. And here's the bonus coverage. The B-side of the single, Child of the Moon. Mick on vocals, Keith Rhythm guitar, backing vocals... Brian, soprano, saxophone, Bill on bass, Charlie, Nikki on organ, maybe piano, and Jimmy, some backing vocals. It was worked on March 29th in the same sessions, March and April. It's the last thread of the psychedelic 67 satanic sessions. It was worked on in July and October of 67. Also known as Child of the Moon, RMK. And a lot of discussions and forums on what did RMK mean? Remake, remark, Alan Klein's daughter, Robin Mary Klein. This tune, along with Flash, are tunes that didn't fit with where they were headed with Beggars. Child of the Moon was released more on compilation albums. With this on the B-side of Jumpin' Jack Flash, it is a different version than the comps. You got that on Hot Rocks, the Singles Collection. And the song had a few outtakes and a four-minute acoustic version, guitar and Nicky on piano. Brian's not on the early takes. This is an outtake that does not have any lead vocals. This is from March of 68. This is fantastic, and this version could fit in on Beggars. Love hearing how Nikki is on this, and the acoustic guitar is great and multi-tracked. Keith plays his Black Beauty Les Paul Custom. 
a painted one. The one he painted himself, a psychedelic moon scene. Tar tuning is in open E. Some people play it in open D. They're using a Vox AC30 amp and not 100% sure, but there may be a second guitar. Brian will play the sax, a soprano sax, and we can hear Brian on this isolated track right here from Brian Jones Resource YouTube channel. That high pitch is Brian. It's a violin sound. Bill's bass is so obvious, and it's a fuzz bass. You can pick this out easily, and it sounds like a lead instrument. The opening of the tune, we hear some type of guitar chord lingering, a hum, or the end of a chord, and it fades into Keith. We then are greeted by what sounds like, to me, <laughs> kids playing in the street. But no, there are several thoughts, Mick, Keith, no, but it's Jimmy, and it's hard to make out, but what he is saying is lame prick society. I'll be glad I can pay my taxes if I'm stoned. Yeah, this had to be some type of inside joke or just being stoned. I'm going to play it twice for you here. <laughs> We then get Nikki and Bill and a little Keith guitar lick. The wind blows right into my face. Now, lyrically, it has a slight flow of a story. And Moonchild is an astrological sign. A romantic song from Mick to Marianne. Probably. I think she had some influence in this. Make them piece together some combination the way the great lyricists do. mentioned earlier about the timeline and the sequence of events that happened and it was a little challenge so I'll just say one thing like Bill's book says something one other resource says one thing two other resources say something else and it's regarding the shooting of the uh, promo films the three of them so let's just push aside the exact dates not go there in the sequence I'm just going to give you information about it. Mick would work with Jimmy Miller and also Glenn Johns, helping out with engineering, would work on the backing tracks for the promotional videos. Directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg. Michael got his start at 24 years old, directing some episodes of the British TV show Ready, Steady, Go. This is where he met the Stones. Michael was born in New York City, and his father was an English baronet, Edward Lindsay Hogg, and his mom, an Irish actress, Geraldine Fitzgerald. He would meet many celebrities, like Charlie Chaplin, Betty Davis, Lawrence Olivier, Humphrey Bogart, Henry Miller. Now, Michael, after Ready, Steady, Go, he would be working with the Stones on this promo and well after this one 15 other videos
Now for both videos, Keith would use his Gibson custom Black Beauty Les Paul, the one he painted. And Brian uses Keith's blue Fender Telly. Bill is using his Dallas Tuxedo Bass and Charlie his Ludwig. The first video was shot early afternoon. Pretty basic shooting, putting in some special lighting here and there. They are in the dark with lighting on their faces. Lip synced and as you heard opens up with the version of Jumpin' Jack Flash saying yeah, yeah, yeah. Plenty of close-ups of Mick. He does get a little bit looser as the video goes on. Some resources would say that the Painted Faces second promo video shot on another day was done on the same day as Child of the Moon, which was done out in the countryside. Michael had said at some point while they were all in a meal break, he would see Brian sitting at the makeup table and playing around with the makeup colors and putting them on his face and then wiping them off and just trying it out. Michael began thinking about the look and then told Mick, Keith, Bill, and Charlie to give the makeup a try also. Michael did have a makeup artist there to assist and they just all got into it. Now we have to remember Mick wore the makeup in 2000 light years from home and he did look close to that image with the stripes and the shapes on his chest. Keith would wear gold tinted makeup, Brian a green tint, Bill and Charlie would wear heavy eye makeup. After they're done, they looked around and they found some big props of space alien sunglasses. So now with this look, it did provide a nicer additional dimension for the visuals, along with the makeup. Towards the end of the video, I love how Mick is barefoot in this and prancing around. And the Stones would love this version. And as video media goes, well, we know what the 80s, most of us know what the 80s videos did. And especially back then, and a means to promote bands and artists to the public. This was huge at that time. And back in the 60s, it was even bigger. The bigger bands were able to use this promotional tools. The public would be able to see these videos shown on the TV shows. Top of the Pops, Shindig, Hullabaloo, and in the U.S., the Smothers Brothers comedy show. This video was shown, Top of the Pops, May 23rd, June 6th, and December 25th. For those of you who have seen this video, you know how head-scratching it is and reading up on deep meanings again spiritual astrological it was shot in the countryside of Surrey in Epping Forest it opens with an actress Eileen Atkins she has a dirty face and she's teary she's walking in the woods dark woods there's a light on her then a shot of the four stones, a muddy road with a wooden bridge. Brian was supposed to be filmed in a tree, but when his time came to shoot this, he was lost somewhere where he wandered up away on his own Mick was pretty annoyed with Brian now Mick and Keith were to appear on horseback at one point
It is shot like a cult horror flick. Now, the Stones were invited to the NME New Music Express Poll Awards show. They were a winner. This was for May 12th at Wembley. This award was prestigious. The UK in 1953 it started just after the magazine was created. Even Elvis was given an award in 1960. He actually sent in a handwritten note for the acceptance, though. There were other attendees invited to this show for the 12th. Dusty Springfield, Status Quo, The Move, The Herd, Bee Gees, Lulu, Cliff Richard, and The Shadows. But, sadly to say, the host was Jimmy Seville. The footage is rare one and no audio is accompanying it of the Stones playing. Roger Moore, who was popular on the TV show Call the Saint, would introduce the Stones and accept the award. So the Stones were very nervous about this event. They did not rehearse and only wanted to play Jumpin' Jack Flash. But once they got in front of the screaming fans and got a wonderful welcome and felt that crazy vibe, they went into satisfaction and they got a real good reception. Keith would use his moon-painted Gibson Les Paul, Brian, ES-330 TD, Charlie the Ludwig, Bill used a new Sunbird Vox Wyman bass. They used a wall of Vox amps, but this was shared by all the bands. Now Brian would say in May 68, the more I hear Jumpin' Jack Flash, the more I realize it was wrong to think that Child of the Moon was the more commercial side of the single. It had the same appeal as Satisfaction, and I'm getting to love it. I'd like to go back to the thought of Brian playing some guitar in this tune, although not audible. Go back to the questioning of that. In Bill's book, Rolling with the Stones, page 303, he does mention Brian guitar. So I'm going to fast forward. December 11th, 12th, 1968, the filming of Rock and Roll Circus. Thanks to the Brian Jones Resource Channel on YouTube on this info. So you're hearing the isolation of Brian, Keith, and Mick. Listening to this, you hear the two guitars. It's proof that Brian did play live on this tune. It was his point to show that Brian's live contribution to prove some of the doubters out there. Brian's guitar has a lower bass sound. It really sounds like a bass, but it's not. Very, very bassy. The obvious other one is Keith. So what I want to do now is something fun. I always was intrigued with how Jumpin' Jack Flash and the evolution of the song played live went through the eras of Mick Taylor to Ronnie and how different it was from 69 all the way to current and the presentation on how they wanted to play it. There were different styles depending on the tour. I'll give a bit of a flavor of some of the live versions, and we could hear the development of it through the years. 
So the next time it would be played, 1969 in Hyde Park. It was the second song of the set. They do not play that acoustic intro with Watch It. Mick Taylor now involved. Keith playing an open G, capo at the fourth. Mick Taylor not playing anything sophisticated. We do not hear any lead type riffs. Mick does a watch it get down. Charlie and Bill doing some great rhythm and the song does not have an extended outro. So we go to November 69 during that tour. Madison Square Garden. Yep, get your yayas out. Opening song. We got Mick throwing some punches, and he is just impeccable. In fact, the band is impeccable. They're flawless, they're so tight. but still no leads up front or during the interludes. And Mick does eventually seem so into it, but not moving about as much. We do hear later on Mick Taylor break into his style of leads, but there's not a long outro. STP 1972, Texas, played second to last song before Street Fighting Man now. Right into the riff, Keith with his open G. banging the tambourine full guitar combination very thick here Mick is super comfortable prancing you hear the piano after the chorus Mick Taylor goes into his tearing the tearing type lead licks he does with Mick and his Jagger jumps.
We see Keith really feeling it, and you could see his love for this tune. No backup vocals yet. Jumpin' Jack Flash live versions are still around 3 minutes and 45 seconds long. Well, we come now to 73, the Brussels Affair sound. The band pushes this, and we hear Keith grooving. Keith is pushing this riff, throwing in a few little embellishments in there. A little different. It mixes clearer on him. And he's in a trance. He's fixated on his passion. Taylor's lead sound a little bit different by his choice. He's playing the leads his way still. And listen to that Bill bass and Charlie. I talk plenty about this album on my other Goat's Head Soup documentary. at three minutes and about 26 seconds time they still don't have long outros going we now come to the new era with ronnie la forum 1975 end of the tour of the americas they play jumping jack flash second to last before sympathy for the devil as the encore In his L.A. Forum clip, we did see Keith having guitar tunings and some issues going on. He did seem a bit out of sync at first. great Ronnie's adding some of the studio cut leads in the song but also adding some of his flair and his style Mick is all over the place with this big stage, this wonderful Lotus stage, that he gets out of breath and his l lyrics and his words start dragging the bit.
Johnny does last his leads for the outro. Piercing leads with all the others jamming heavy. This is the guitar band we've been waiting for for this tune. They're just letting it loose. Charlie and Ollie, they pick it up and cranking it and pushing everybody to another level. So this starts the long versions. This one clocked in at 8 minutes and 17 seconds. Maybe Mick wanted to extend to do his theatrics of the water bucket dumping and just running around and more Jagger jumps. You gotta love this version. This is just golden for me. Jump to 1977, the Elma Combo Show. This version could be one of my favorites, five minutes and 26 seconds long. The sound on this one is so crisp, and Ronnie comes in perfectly. He plays some of the leads at the chorus, but not fully there yet to the studio album. He's adding his own flair still. Listen to Mick here. I was drowned and washed up. I just love the work by all here. We can only dream and imagine the visual on this tune. In the interlude, we get to hear Billy and Stu. But listen to Ronnie. They are flying here and so tight as Charlie races through. This one is worth to let it roll and all experience it.
I am repeating myself on this next version of Some Girls 1978, Texas, but this is another killer version. The energy is above and beyond. Mick's got that nastiness about him, that raw edge. In fact, they all do. Mick is just on a rampage, and his alter Mick performer ego is flying high. What is cool, we hear the chorus of Keith and Ronnie singing. If this is not moving you towards understanding why they are the greatest, I don't know, check your pulse. Tattoo You Tour 81-82. I listened to several versions from different cities for Jumpin' Jack Flash, Seattle, Kansas City, others, Leeds, July 25th. That happened to be Stu's last show. The Hampton Live one is the closest, the cleanest, best to me. And it was played as the last song, 24th song. Keith is on his A game. They are meshing. Very close here with the leads, like the single sound. He intertwines this throughout the jam. We got Mick in the cherry picker to make this one extend and go longer. And more Ronnie and Keith singing the backup, which is phenomenal.
Keith adds some of his leads here too and more of the Charlie pounding. Again, another worthy point of a guitar band. This one lasted 8 minutes and 16 seconds. There is a change from the last tours when they're playing this song. You could see it when you watch the video clips and you hear the tune itself now. 1989, Atlantic City, Steel Wheels and Urban Jungle Tour with Chuck Lavelle conducting now. And we now get the Stones working on the sounds closer to the single and adding the backup singing. It's become a business. is now more calculated and does have the leads filled in more and you could see Mick just loves to perform this song but yeah there is a but when compared to the last tours the Mick show is now less raw less improvised it's, it's less angry he does show his conditioning when he runs side to side a lot and his now presentation is a bit different. And don't get me wrong, seeing them live, there's nothing ever like it. It's always powerful. Just the comparison of the song throughout the tours. The band jams this one and still great to hear running at 6 minutes 19 seconds. But with a larger band, it does now sound different. Same tour, but now to the Tokyo Dome, 1990. I like this version. It's very polished.
Ronnie is playing even closer to the single now. A subdued rhythm, especially in the beginning, but playing much more of the flash leads. Keith is focused on his rhythm, and the background vocals for the chorus is eminent. And Ronnie and Keith have some wonderful dueling, and that's probably why I really like this version. They're doing the weave again so beautifully, and we hear Keith with his patented leads. In a way, Mick extends the song. He's showing his calisthenics and skipping, and, and now with these bigger stages, he is connecting with all of the audience much more. And I'm still seeing and feeling his passion for playing this tune. Now, Mick being around 47 years old now is a bit lighter on the Jagger jumps. Keith playing his telly in open G, Capoed at the fourth, this one goes for six minutes, 58 seconds, and they did pour this one on. I was torn on which show to focus on for Voodoo Lounge Tour in 95. They were hot this tour, on fire. But Brixton Academy on July 19th was a kick-ass show, like they all were. They just played Wembley a week or so before with the Black Crows. <laughs> Ronnie's a bit lost in the beginning during the verses. Keith is remarkable. No Bill this tour. He's gone. Welcome, Daryl. Still, the Stones know how to keep this tune going. The intensity in this small venue proves how much they give it for the fans. They are feeling the groove. Daryl is wonderful. Charlie is just driving and pounding and carries the band on his shoulders.
this one has the horns added and you surely hear the organ at the end and the backing vocals. This one's clocked in at 4 minutes and 58 seconds. Nineteen ninety eight Bridges to Babylon tour. The song is loud, it's full, and the guitar is pretty edgy. Mick front and center at first. There is a point where Keith jumps off stage to walk around in the front. He stops playing, and for that gap of time, you hear that his guitar is missing and how powerful it really is for the song when it's not played. Mick gets to work with the fans as the jam goes on. And Keith is heard much more than Ronnie, who's playing some single leads, and Charlie's not double timing as he's done in the past. This one clocks in at 6 minutes 27 seconds. Two thousand and three, Madison Square Garden, New York City, licked live. This one features Ronnie using that sitar guitar on top of all that energy. plays the single riff plenty on this one, along with some wonderful double stops. The power of this tune is carried through. This is Ronnie's Dan Electro with Baby Sitar. It's also used for Paint It Black and Street Fighting Man. He was loaned this guitar. Now added to the layers of sound, and it's pretty buried, is Blondie's acoustic. It's plenty of horns, but Ronnie jams his older style leads. This one goes to five minutes and 46 seconds.
2006 Beacon Theater, Bigger Bang Tour. This one is the opener. I do have two issues though. That is with the shooting style. I can't get a feel with all the quick movement and the constant camera cuts. Then, the worst part is the fake audience in front. When I think about this and see 63 year old Mick still rocking, it has got to make you smile. Amazing. This one's clocked at 3 minutes and 55 seconds, much shorter, but still jamming on this one. The sound on this is not just good, not great, it's fantastic. The guitars are heard up front and so clear, and you feel that power. Hyde Park 50 and counting tour great sound are you doing good out there I can't see you but I know you're beautiful For this song, we are hearing the pace is much slower than usual. Pure guitar weaving with Ronnie and Keith on this one. We notice this new guitar that Ronnie's playing. Really cool. Versol Raya 6 Custom. He owns several electrics and acoustics. This Roya model is a high end and it's customized. It was made, designed in 2006. Handmade in Finland. It was originally supposed to go to Billy Gibbons. Ronnie fell in love with this solid body instead. Billy 
will follow a year later. This guitar has two vintage looking twin humbuckers designed by the Versole owner. Not a typical humbucker sound. The custom version costs about $20,000. It does have gold leaf. There's not a lot of isolated footage of Chuck Lavelle, who is a rock and roll royalty in my eyes. And he's a true gentleman and a hidden gem with much charm. He was the one to have the Stones expand and dig into their archives and break out what many wanted to hear. He started with them in the Tattoo U 1982 portion of the tour. The one thing I got to admire with Chuck for even more than his wonderful music is his passion for his wife of 45 plus years together. Played Havana, Cuba, March 25th, 2016. They would open up with Flash. It was a free outdoor concert. Mick was full of energy. It's another slower version, and Keith has a light blue telly, and Ronnie using the same Versol. Pretty much now, textbook sound and styles. Mick moving side to side on stage, 73 years old. Bless all of them. This one clocks in at 4 minutes and 36 seconds.
And the last version I have live is from Stockholm, Sweden, July 31st, 2022. Thank you, Matt Lee, the Guinness World Record Rolling Stones collector and author of a number one book. Get some real good seats. And this one is pretty straightforward. Same as the last uh, 2016 tour version. And Ronnie with his Versol, Keith with his Blue Telly, still going with that now. In life, Keith's book, he adds, when you get a riff like Flash, you get a feeling of elation, a wicked glee. The band just takes off behind me. If he can play only one of his riffs ever again, he would say, give me Flash. Levitation is probably the closest analogy to what I feel. Keith would explain his feelings for this song and say, as soon as I pick up the guitar and play that riff, something happens here in your stomach. I go into turbo overdrive. It is one of the better feelings in the world. You just jump on the riff and it plays you. Keith considers Flash as the best thing they ever did with Jimmy Miller. Mick and Keith, 79 years old, Ronnie's 74. Still cranking Jumpin' Jack Flash. And we hope we get more. So at this time, I feel I surely exposed this song's true inner depths. We just witnessed this fabulous song and its power. Yeah. 